Hi, everyone. Greetings. Genesis chapter 3. We're reading verses 9 to 13. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. God's Methods with Men. I remember that's the title of a book by Campbell Morgan, which struck me hmm. way back. And I thought, as the decades went by, yes, I can understand where he's coming from. Because here you have what appears to be, if, if you take this, the story on the surface level, God doesn't know. Hmm. And he asks a series of questions. And the very first one is so profound. I know, where are you? Do we really think, even when we were Jehovah's Witnesses, mm -hmm. that God didn't know where they were? Yeah. And, and didn't know the answers to the subsequent questions. Yeah. No. But this seems to be in parallel with the way Jesus taught, too. And, as Job, in Job, um, the same thing. God just gives them a whole bunch of questions. He doesn't answer any of their questions. He just gives them a whole bunch more. So, so this way, is his way of teaching. In Job's case, it doesn't seem to matter, because Job seems to forget his questions when God starts asking his. Yeah. But, hmm. but yes, in the New Testament, you have Christ, not just with his enemies, i.e. asking them questions when they ask, have already mm -hmm. asked him one, but even with his friends, mm -hmm. teaching by the means of questions and illustrations and parables. Yeah. I had a little note for verse 10 in, uh, when I was doing it with my Kidner commentary. Kidner makes mention of the fact that in verse 10, fear, it's the first time fear is mentioned mm -hmm. in Scripture. And that's part of the fallen condition. So you don't ever hear this before. Suddenly man is afraid. And that's death. And this is what we don't notice yeah. when we're witnesses, that that break of communion of faith is what constitutes death. Mm -hmm. Spiritual death is real death. It's not metaphorical death, as you think as a witness. Yeah. It's real death. So the question, where are you? Even the fact that God asked the question, and goes seeking them, although he knows what's happened. Yeah. The, he goes seeking them, and that's what also we would have missed as witnesses, right? Yeah. God has to make the first move. Mm -hmm. It's the guilt that makes us afraid. The question on our study page says, what does it imply as to the nature of death and the sequence in salvation? And then there's a couple of very pregnant quotes here from Franz Delitzsch and Charles Spurgeon. Delitzsch says, God seeks him not because he is lost from his knowledge, but from his communion. And then Spurgeon says, God comes to man, man seeks not his God. Despite all the doctrines which proud free will has manufactured, there, was never, there has never been found from Adam's day until now a single instance in which the sinner first sought his God. God must first seek him. And I remember that it hit you hard when we studied Romans, that mm -hmm. it gives no space for our efforts to, to find God. Yeah, it makes the statement that no one seeks, not even one. Romans 3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. J.P. Lang says in his commentary on Genesis, it is a consequence of the very being of God as a person, if he would not violently surprise man with his omnipresence and his omniscience, that he should freely assume the form of seeking him, that is, of drawing nigh unto him gradually in a way of mercy, since man must seek and find him. The good shepherd seeks and finds the lost sheep. The sinner must seek and find God. The relation must be an ethical covenant relation. So it Yes, we're conscious of seeking God, but we don't realize the very fact that we are seeking God now is God already at work. Yeah, that he, he has put the desire to seek for him in yeah. us. This is a text I, I, I don't think I could have believed as a Jehovah's Witness. This is Philippians chapter 
2 verse 12 and 13. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Yeah. So work out your own salvation doesn't mean work for your own salvation, and nor is it our work, mm -hmm. because it's God, it says, who is working in us, both to will and to work. So he starts yeah. the process and, and we collaborate in the process of working out our salvation. Mm -hmm. But it, it makes it plain it's for his good pleasure. He wants to save us. Yeah. And unless he wants to save us first, we will never be saved. Mm -hmm. So the two things that seem opposites working together for God's purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in verses 10 to 13, uh, Shame, guilt, is man's is, is the first seed that you see of the, the first fruit you see of sin. Mm -hmm. But then there are answers. There's a second sin, a second uh, level of sin mm -hmm. here in their answers. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Campbell Morgan, you want me to read the quote? Sure. Campbell Morgan says that was the answer of unutterable meanness revealing the capacity of man out of touch with God for dastardly action toward a fellow being. Adam was the first cad, <laughs> and there has been a long succession of them. <laughs> there, there's words you don't see or hear much anymore, no. dastardly and cad. <laughs> it shows yeah. you when Morgan was born around more than a century ago. Mm -hmm. But what is a cad? Well, <laughs> The blame game. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. blames his wife, or blames God, really. Yeah, because he says, God, the, the woman you put here. <laughs> Boy, that's cheek. And she, on the other hand, or is it on the other hand? She blames the, the serpent. Another way of saying, you shouldn't have put the serpent there. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, <laughs> yeah, it's not my fault. <laughs> McLaren says to all of this, the second consequence of the fall is the disturbed relation with God, which is presented in the highly symbolical form fitting for early ages, and as true and impressive for the 20th century as for them. Sin broke a familiar communion with God, turned him into a, f a fear and a dread, and sent the guilty pair into ambush. Is not that deeply and perpetually true? The sun seen through mist becomes a lurid ball of scowling fire. The impulse is to hide from God or to get rid of thoughts of him. And when he is, is felt to be near, it is as a questioner bringing sin to mind. The shuffling excuses which venture even to throw the blame of sin on God, the woman whom thou gavest me, or which try to palliate it as a mistake, the serpent beguile me, have to come at last, however reluctantly, to confess that I did the sin. Each has to say, I did eat so shall we all have to do. We may throw the blame on circumstances, weakness of judgment, and the like, while here, but at God's bar, that is judgment day, we shall have to say, mea culpa, mea culpa, my, my, my fault, my, mm -hmm. my sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's Alexander McLaren in his expositions of Genesis. So I can't help but mm -hmm. think that this blame game that started in Eden is now at its absolute pitch of intensity, mm -hmm. the highest pitch of intensity, which is, it could even bring on a civil war in the Western world, yeah. right here in North America, because we're all very conscious of everybody else's sin, and I think, mm -hmm. again, of the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, yeah. they're conscious of sin, and sin hasn't completely dropped out of their vocabulary. But they don't tend to use the word sin. They, they talk about mistakes and... and uh, I don't know what other word they use, but they don't usually use the word but, sin. But they sure give you the sense that everybody else in the world is guilty. Yeah. And therefore it's under God's judgment for their sins. Yeah, and yet they will excuse their own sins. Mistakes. And call them mistakes. Yeah, so. <laughs> if someone else does it, it's a sin. If they do it, it's just a mistake. It's And again, back to and God. And there's a God, reason. God is, God, is, God is adjusting our point of view. That's right. It's his fault, therefore, that yeah. we we made yeah. mistakes in the past. It it also this this one uh, line here, the impulse to hide from God, or to get rid of thoughts of Him. That reminded me of one of the videos I did with C.S. Lewis, who who talks. The demons know this. 
that if if you if you get a person doing something they know they shouldn't be doing even if it's not a major deal a major sin you can get them so that they feel like they don't want to think about God this is one of the the devil's yeah tricks right it doesn't have to be something mm. Dastardly, yeah. <laughs> to use Morgan's word, it doesn't have to be a dastardly sin to be a sin. If it takes you away from consciousness of God, of communion with God, yeah, it's that's, done. It's that's done enough. its job for the devil, anyway. So yeah, the demons are just happy. Then. We'll put a link into James Orr's discussion of sin and lawlessness, and total depravity, as it's called by some of our reformed brethren. And next time, sin's sentence, God sentences Adam and Eve and the whole human race mm -hmm. and the serpent. Mm -hmm.